Patently, from the very beginning, the Royal Society attracted the best minds. This combination of great minds and boundless curiosity is obviously a good formula for forming a learned society, but that alone has actually not been enough to sustain 350 years of continuous distinction at the very highest level. For that, the Royal Society needed to do certain other things, things that no other society had ever done before. Three in particular, I think, stand out. Excuse me. First, from its earliest days, the Royal Society was truly international. As they like to remind you at the Royal Society, it had a foreign secretary 100 years before the British government did. Just three years after its founding, it accepted its first foreign members, and soon it was welcoming papers from contributors like Marcello Malpighi in Italy and the great, eccentric, and wonderfully prolific microsco microscopist Anton van Leeuwenhoek in the Netherlands. The result that it, was became, it became a, the central clearinghouse for scientific information in the world, a kind of early version of the World Wide Web. Second, the society has always elected people for their abilities rather than for their background or bearing. It was the first really important institution in the world to be driven primarily by merit rather than considerations of breeding. Third, and in many ways the most extraordinary of all, the Royal Society has always had the most incredible knack for selecting people before they gave any particular hint of the greatness that would earn them their posterity. Edmund Halley was made a fellow before he'd even finished at Oxford. Charles Darwin, elected in 1839, just three years after his youthful Beagle voyage, was not even known for his work on barnacles, much less on evolution, when he became a fellow. William Henry Fox Talbot was elevated to fellowship long before he had the first vague inkling of giving the world photography. It is extraordinary, truly, how many fellows of the Royal Society achieved their greatest distinction after joining. In consequence, the society didn't become a club of grand old men whose greatest achievements were behind them, but rather a place whose members were firmly and excitingly at the leading edge of scientific development. It is these additional aspects I would submit that have truly made the Royal Society incomparable, enduring, and important. Indeed, important in ways beyond anything that anyone could ever have foreseen or imagined when it was founded. 